Hello all, this is day three of the epistemology week, week four, and today we'll do be doing Edmund Gettier's It's Justified True Belief, Knowledge. So, having done the Theotetus reading, you'll notice in a certain sense that this Gettier writing is, in a certain sense, redundant. Um, you might characterize this paper as basically being an more in-depth and technical variants of the last portion of the um, Theotetus where Socrates considers the various different accounts of a count, um, various different accounts of explanation, and rejects them, or at least isn't satisfied with any of them. So this that's basically what Gettier does as well. Um, this paper is significant insofar as it does this in a very clear way, and it sort of reinvigorated epistemology. It also has sort of a fun story. So the legend has it that uh, Gettier was up for tenure. He was stressed out because he hadn't published anything significant in some time. Um, he was racking his brain to try to come up with something so he could keep his job and retain his livelihood. And it just suddenly struck him that this hadn't been addressed in this way. And and he wrote this paper, and it's a very short paper, and now it's a classic, and it's taught in classes across the country and world. So, kind of a fun little story. Um, and some people accuse him of ripping off Plato, and I'll leave that up to you, although I don't think he does it quite the same way. So, um, the question is, justified true belief knowledge? And ultimately, he'll say no, but finding out why is half the battle. So, the first thing is just to be clear on our terms. So, a feature of the period, um, 20th century in particular, is that knowledge was generally characterized as a conjunction of the following three conditions. Um, so, the first of which is that any proposition or statement P is in fact true, the person in question believes P, and that person is justified in believing that proposition P. So um, one interesting thing to note is that knowledge is something that inheres in agents, right? So it, you have to have certain sorts of mental states or um, belief states in order for it to constitute knowledge. And so that's kind of the picture that we're working with. And so there have been attempts on other grounds to sort of argue against this notion and say that you don't need to have any sort of um, mental state for it to be knowledge. You can just you can know how you can act in a certain sort of way, and that might be sufficient. Or maybe um, you might think certain sorts of animals know how to do things, even if they don't believe anything. Um, but anyways, with that sort of aside, this is the general characterization, and so um, Edmund will be arguing against that. And hopefully, this lecture is much shorter than the last one, so I'll try to move along. Um, so the general contention, and Gettier is great about being clear on this, he says, I shall argue that A is false and that the conditions stated therein do not constitute a sufficient condition for the truth of a proposition that S knows that P. So A, if you notice, is just these three conditions. So A is just a conjunction of the claim that P is true, S believes P, and S is justified in believing P. So um, the contention is that those three conditions are not sufficient to constitute knowledge. Uh, there will be cases in which all three of those conditions obtain, and yet we wouldn't say that someone knows something. So um, in order to illustrate this point, Gettier provides a couple cases. So the first case um, is one in which Jones has 10 coins in his pocket and he will be selected for a job. So the case is there's two dudes, Smith and Jones, and Smith knows various things about Jones. So first of all, Smith knows that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. He counted them himself and stuck them in there. And Smith also is justified in believing that Jones will get the job because Smith knows um, the boss in charge or whatever, whoever's deciding this process, and 
The boss in confidence told Smith, Jones is going to get this job. You can trust me. Um, so from those claims, you can generalize to the proposition, a man with 10 coins in his pocket will get the job. So E here is just a logical product of D. So if Jones has 10 coins in his pocket and Jones will get the job, then some man with 10 coins in his pocket will get the job. That's just sort of a different way of saying the same thing. It's a generalization from the initial claim, right? So if there's some particular individual, um, there exists someone that fits that description, right? So if Tim is playing baseball in the park, someone is playing baseball in the park, right? That's just um, same sort of idea here. If Jones is, has 10 coins in his pocket and Jones will get the job, someone with 10 coins in their pocket will get the job. Um, but the twist here that's kind of uh, supposed to be the exciting point is that Smith ends up getting the job and Smith has 10 coins in his pocket. So at the end of the day, um, it ends up being true. E is true. Right? So, Smith believes that a man with 10 coins in his pocket will get the job. It's true that this person will get the job, or some person with 10 coins in their pocket will get the job. And Smith is justified in believing this because he was told on very good confidence from the boss that Jones will get the job, or, and then you generalize, a man with 10 coins in his pocket will get the job. So, with that in mind, it seems like there's a case of justified true belief that a man with 10 coins in his pocket will get the job, and lo and behold, that proposition ends up being true, but it's true for reasons entirely apart from why Smith thought it would be true. So, it seems like this sort, the sort of justification that occurred isn't sufficient. Um, so, justified true belief isn't enough. So, there's another case that might help illustrate if that one's not persuasive to you. So this case is a case in which Jones owns a Ford. So if this, so this is a little bit of logic chopping, um, but it's not terribly technical. It's just a feature of logic that if any proposition, so if P is true, it's always the case that P or Q is going to be true. Just because what or means, sometimes we use the, the symbol, this is kind of, that's the or, but I'll, um, what or means in this context, this, this disjunction, is that one of the two is true. That's all it means, like soup or salad, one of the two is going to obtain. Um, it could be both, but it doesn't need to be both. So. If in the first case P is true, then it's just sort of trivially true that P or Q is going to be true. Because this doesn't say whether or not Q is true, it just says P is true and therefore we know P and something else is going to be true. And so you could even, if you wanted to be, you know, this is just sort of employing logic to strange ends, um, you could say R or whatever else you want. You could do a long string of these. Um, and that extended statement would be true just because P holds. So that's the underlying principle being employed here. Um, so in this case, the claim is that Jones owns a Ford. And so based on that, we can trivially say that Joan, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Boston, or Brown is in Barcelona, or Brown is in Brest, I can't even say that, Litovsk, Brest Litovsk, I feel like that's a famous World War One site, um, in any case, so, right, so what ends up happening in this scenario is that, so, we are justified in believing this proposition because we have reason to believe this one, right? So we can call this one P, 
right? And we can call any of these other ones like P or Q or P or R. And all of these other ones trivially follow from P. You can just um, you can just add on these sort of disjuncts. But what ends up happening is that um, Jones loses the Fords, but Brown happens to be in Barcelona. So at the end of the day, say for example, Jones believes it's already bolded. Jones believes this first proposition, P or Q, he has it's true. This proposition turns out to be true. He's justified in believing it because he knows a whole bunch about Jones, and Jones always has had a Ford and various other things like that. And yeah, so it's true, justified, and of course he believes it. And then Jones loses the Ford, but Brown happens to be in Barcelona, so it turns out that this proposition is true. And he had and Jones had good reason to believe it. Um, or whoever, Smith or whoever, had good reason to believe it. So, once again, it seems like this is justified true belief, uh, but it's not knowledge. So, why is he justified? Because Jones always, Jones always, has always owned a Ford. True because of um, because of Q as a matter of fact and it's a belief because he just for some silly reason was thinking to himself um, he was thinking about logic and he realized well if P then I can also just say Q for no reason and so I'll believe P or Q because that sounds like fun um, and so all these three conditions seem to be obtained but once again we don't want to say it's knowledge so that's the problem. Um, so justified true belief is not sufficient. And then I have a third case. This third case I use because sometimes people get caught up in the logic and they think, oh, well, we're just logic crunching, mashing, and that's why we get these strange results. So think about, I don't know, maybe we'll use Jones again. Jones the farmer this time. So Jones the farmer is standing out on his porch. And he's looking over his, the hills of Appalachia, watching his deer, or sorry, um, his sheep. He has a herd of sheep off in the distance, and he has one favorite sheep that he, he can pick out distinctly, generally. It has a specific spot on the hill far away, and he looks out, and he happens to see some little blob out there, um, and he says, oh, there's my sheep, Betsy. And it just so happens on this day that this blob is uh, a random bale of hay that accumulated um, wool because the sheep like to rub on it or something like that. And it looks just like Betsy, but lo and behold, it's actually a bale of hay with wool on it. And interestingly, um, Betsy happens to be standing behind that bale of hay from the perspective of Jones the farmer. So in this case it seems like the belief that Jones has is Betsy is standing right about there and he can point. Um, he has this belief and this belief is true. Betsy is standing just about where he's pointing and he's justified. He has the sense data that he can refer to. He can say look Betsy tends to stand in this spot and Betsy is a sheep, so it'll look like this. But at the end of the day, it also seems like, well, you don't really know because what you're looking at is just hay with wool on it. So there seems to once again be a disconnection between a justified true belief and knowledge. Um, one objection you might have is that maybe this isn't sufficiently justified. Right, so maybe this really isn't a case of justified true belief because, um, in some way, you know, if you could mistake a bale of hay for a sheep or any of these other cases, 
it's not a resolutely justified um, belief and we're being too hasty, it's not sufficiently justified to constitute knowledge. So if it were more justified, then it would actually be knowledge, and that's why we get these funny results. Um, but in any case, this third case I think is useful because it doesn't rely on any sort of um, relationship between the entailment of propositions or any sort of disjunctions or these sorts of things. But um, there's a much more quick rundown today of the Getty Air problems, and I hope those are interesting. Okay, thanks for your time, and I'll see you next time.